You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. We're distracted and misdirected and we're not paying attention to what is the reason why we're here where we're here. Judah had the same problem. They became, they had all these Eastern influences coming in. For them, it was coming in from Babylon and Assyria and places like that. But they stopped paying attention to why they were God's chosen people and what got them there. And they began to forget the fact that there was a whole generation that died in the wilderness because they said, no, there's giants in the land. They forgot that. And they're no longer paying attention either. Judah's behavior didn't go unnoticed by God. They were so distracted and preoccupied with different influences, they couldn't even hear Isaiah's message from God. Have you been there before? Do you have to keep telling yourself to focus so you won't be distracted? I know I do. Unlike Judah, let's pay attention to what Jesus is telling us and not be distracted by the things of this world. Be mentally and spiritually in the moment. Listen for God's voice. This is Pastor Ken's message today. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Isaiah, chapter 3, as he begins his message, Why Regime Change is Needed. Father, thank you for the fact that you're here and that you're with us and that you love us. And even when there are little glitches, Lord, you're still taking care of us. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to teach, and thank you for the opportunity for us to learn as we as we look to you and to your word, and we once again look into the gospel of Isaiah. Thank you, Lord, and teach us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you notice I said gospel of Isaiah. Yes. It really is. He talks an awful lot about Jesus in, in this book. I mean, it is absolutely amazing. But continuing what we talked about last week, where we were talking about regime change, in chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 15, and Lord willing, we'll get through that this evening, Isaiah starts telling us why regime change is needed in Jerusalem. I mean, even though they have an opportunity to repent, even though there's an offer on the table for them, if they do repent, there's also the other side that if you don't repent, here's what's going to happen. This is the same thing that Moses did. He would say, if you follow the Lord and you do this, then here's the blessings that you get. If you don't follow the Lord, here's what will happen. So as we move into chapter 3, we find that Isaiah, who is writing to us from 725 B.C., okay, a few years back, he's relevant today. In fact, we're going to find that he speaks an awful lot to us as we enter the third decade of the 21st century. We're going to see there's an awful lot of, really? He's talking to us. What's up with this? You know, how can that be? Well, he's a prophet, and the Lord has a tendency of doing that. The warnings to Judah are also warnings to us in these last days. We're under grace, yes, they are under the law, yep, that's true, and the heart of Jesus is the same today as it was in Isaiah's day, that we would repent and return, rather than insist on the other side of what it is is rejection. So bottom line, just as it was for Judah and Jerusalem, repentance equals heaven for eternity. Rejection equals hell for eternity. And that's a message that that's even people aren't hearing a lot in the church anymore. Uh, universalism is beginning to take over, and, it's, and there's books that say, I love wins. And I'm going like, well, no. Jesus talked an awful lot about hell, and there's a reason why. He doesn't want anybody to go there. So our choice, as well as the choice for Judah, is the same. You know, follow the Lord and repent, or keep doing what you want to do and reap the consequences of it. The closing thought from Isaiah in chapter 2 was basically stop holding men, what they do, what they say, how they lead, in higher regard than Yahweh. So it's kind of like for a college student, be quit holding that professor in a higher level than God. The college professor is just a man. God is God, and he knows much better than that. That's a problem for Judah. It's a problem for us today. We have experts. In fact, I worked as an expert. That's called a consultant, okay? And that's what they're called these days. But it is, it's an example of how you know, people rely on folks who've been there, done it, and got the T-shirt to tell them, what am I doing wrong? And, and sometimes it's kind of like, I'll never forget talking to one individual who was a CEO of a company. 
And he wanted to know, well, what are we doing wrong? And I'm going, I don't know. I have to take a look at this first. And he says, you may not be doing anything wrong. You might just be naturally losing $20 million a year. And he's going like, what? No, can't be. So anyway, being an consultant was fun. I don't really want to do that anymore. But that's where man listens to man. We need to rely on God and God's wisdom rather than man's wisdom. And Judah was not. Judah was relying on man's wisdom. And that's a problem we have today. We want, to rely, we want an answer. We want to know what the answer is. And sometimes waiting on the Lord is not adequate, even though that's what the Bible says we have to do is wait on Him. I find it amazing how most people will ignore the testimony of God's Word and instead of rely on a thought from man. The, the number one thought in our culture today comes from a philosopher who died, he's gone, in the 1840s. He was from Germany, and his name was Nietzsche. He wrote that in, in his book, Thus Spake Zarathustra, God is dead. Well, that's the culture's viewpoint today, but God's viewpoint is Nietzsche is dead. Yeah, he's gone. He's the one who's dead. It's a lot simpler than uh, what he thought. God's response includes this. In Revelation 22:13. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus has always been. He always will be. He will not ever not be. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Now, in light of that, what about man? Well, it says here, inasmuch as it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So for those who have made the decision to repent and follow, yeah, after this comes judgment, but Jesus took care of that for us. But for those who insist on doing life their own way and insist on not having Jesus involved in it, there's still accountability to him. That's what Hebrews is talking about. And that accountability is in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. And it's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And I saw the great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. For Judah, if they don't repent, that's what they're looking forward to. Now that, this is from the book of Revelation. Well, they would just say they're going to Sheol and they're going to be in Sheol. That's all they would know. But here in chapter 3, the folly of following men rather than God is exposed as that it's revealed that it is one of the tools that God's going to use to turn Judah's heart back to him. He's going to do something that's going to surprise the nation. He's going to remove all their leaders. Everyone that they think they have to rely upon for leadership and guidance and direction, God's going to take them away. Now, the contrast with the present day as we take a look at, and I'm talking present day for Isaiah, again, we were talking about how they understand history, how they understand past, present, and future. They have to have a contrast. Here's what it is presently, and we already saw what it could be and what it was in the past, but what you have present shows that, then you start showing the, the difference between the present and the past and the future. Then they can understand, oh, okay, I, I get why there is this prophet who's telling me I need to change. One of the hallmarks of prophecy in the Old Testament is that you're going to see things in prophecy that will have in the same paragraph something that's going to happen in two weeks, something that's going to happen in two years, and something that'll happen in about 3,000 years, all in the same line. I mean, you have to remember, when Jesus went to the synagogue and he read, read from the book of Isaiah, he stopped at a comma and then sat down. Because the next thing was, and vengeance of the Lord. That wasn't his first coming, that's his second coming. So he stopped. He kind of showed us that kind of, that's the way, they, that's the, way the prophets would work. And the reason for that is, is for a prophet, if you were wrong, it carried the death penalty. So the Lord would give them something to validate them immediately so that they would know, oh yeah, he's a prophet of God. Because if that's taking place, then everything else the prophet says will also take place too. The first 15 verses of chapter 3 will expose to the entire universe that the command that God gave in Isaiah 2.22 is not being followed, not at all. And what we'll see with this is that there's a maxim that, that you learn in political science is that people will vote for whatever they want. And the problem is, is that also existed in kingdoms too. 
unless there's something great within the community, there's nothing that can come up from that. Leaders will reflect the spiritual poverty of the community, and that's kind of what we've been seeing politically uh, around the world, not just in this country, but it's happening everywhere. In our culture, and I'm not re reflecting just one nation, this is multiple nations, the leadership reflects the spiritual and moral conditions of those who they intend to lead. And when you have a strong leader who emerges, who goes against the flow, pushback occurs. And, and we've seen that historically, time after time after time. Doesn't matter what country you're in. We see that today, and we also see that in the history of Judah. There's going to be two runs before the nation goes away into captivity with Babylon of revival, but the whole nation will not turn towards it. They just won't. So the contrast that we've already begun to see between the conditions of Judah as the ministry of Isaiah kicks off, because we're still at the beginning of his ministry, a lot of the things he's writing about haven't happened yet, are like the conditions that we see in our culture today. And that's, the, that's a sad thing. Stop and think about it. Judah had economic and military strength. Our culture has economic and military strength. So does many cultures throughout the world. But would you consider our culture to be saved or horribly lost? I would say horribly lost. In our culture today, we have foreign influences, like you wouldn't believe. We have Eastern religions and Eastern religious thought. 20 years ago, it was Hinduism. Now it's Islam, but it's still Eastern from that perspective. We're distracted and misdirected, and we're not paying attention to what is the reason why we're here where we're here. Judah had the same problem. They, became, they had all these Eastern influences coming in. For them, it was coming in from Babylon and Assyria and places like that. But they stopped paying attention to why they were God's chosen people and what got them there, and they began to forget the fact that there was a whole generation that died in the wilderness because they said, no, there's giants in the land. They forgot that, and they're no longer paying attention either. Now, I'm not saying that means that we're going to be judged. They're, again, we're under grace. They're not. They're under the law, so there's a difference. But it leads to the same place spiritually as we see in Jerusalem of Isaiah's time. The only difference is that we're under the age of grace. There is the Lord still would, would have all men to be saved, and that's why we still, it's still important for us to share his message to as many as, as we possibly can. Two-thirds of all young adults who once were churchgoers, and this is, a brand, this is a brand new number that came out of Barna Research Group, have now dropped out. 64% of all young people have dropped out of church and they're not, they haven't returned. That number went from 58% to 64% in 10 years. And they're not coming back. The contention of the Barna Group is that today's society is especially and insidiously faith repellent. In other words, they're turning to other things and they don't need God anymore. Instead of asking a question and talking to somebody about, well, what's my future spiritually, they can, they can ask Google and find out, like it's going to give them a good answer. So I, I love the term that the Barna Group has given to everybody who's reading devices instead of interacting with people. They're calling it digital Babylon. That's a good term. It really is, because it very easily character and very characteristically gives the same things that Babylon was doing. It was trying to change people. One other thing. There is a gentleman by the name of Sir Alexander Fraser Tyler, and he uh, wrote a thesis called The Cycle of Nations. He's talking about the Athenian Republic, okay? And he wrote that a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It only exists until the voters discover they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. He's writing in the 1850s. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with a result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy and is always followed by dictatorship. And I can go back to 200 B.C. and show you that in the Roman, Roman Republic. I mean, it, it has not changed. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been 200 years, and these nations have progressed through the following sequence. From bondage to spiritual faith. And you can see Judah in this, too. From spiritual faith to great courage. From courage to liberty. From liberty to abundance. From abundance to selfishness. From selfishness to complacency. And from complacency to apathy. From apathy to dependency. And from dependency right back into bondage. And the problem is, I'm a historian by training. I can see that all throughout history. And I see that in Judah. I also see that in our culture today. And it's not just in this nation. It's in many nations throughout the world. So if you don't think that the Lord's getting this world ready for something really big, like the rapture of the church, he is. 
And you can see it everywhere in the, in the world right now. But here's Yahweh's solution for Judah. It's in the first, it's here in chapter 3. And this is what he's going to do to try and draw him back. Verses 1 to 3, Behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread, the whole supply of water, the mighty man, the warrior, the judge, and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan, and the skillful enchanter, or if you look in one Hebrew word, which, that tells you the problem in their culture at that point. It is not man, this is what the Lord's saying, it's not man, it's not earthly kingdoms, it's not things that man created that should be trusted. And to get his point across, he's, he's basically saying, if you follow what I say in verse 22 of chapter 2, and you take the offer that I offered back in chapter 1, we won't go here. But if you won't, and I know your heart and you won't, then this is what I'm going to do to get your attention. I'm going to take all your leadership away from you, and I'm going to outline it for you. He uses the same title, by the way, for Yahweh here, the Lord God of hosts, that we talked about before, the master or Yahweh leader, the God of heavenly armies. He's the one who's causing the events to take place. Not man, but the master, the Lord, the one who has all of heaven's armies. He's the one doing it. But the, the folks in Judah would be telling Isaiah this, but everything's good. We got two chariots in the garage. The wine is really flowing out of the fields right now. Agriculture is good. We've got a professional military. There's no problem. Everything looks good. And meanwhile, there's, there, soon there will be a guy born. His name is Jeremiah. He's not around yet. But Jeremiah tells us in chapter 17, the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Okay, you can say everything's good, Judah, Jerusalem, but it's not. There's an underlying current of rot that's taking place. And unfortunately, when I say that, I'm also saying that happens in our culture today, too. There's an underlying level of rot that exists. The glory of the kingdom at that time carried in it. So here's, here's how glorious it was in Jerusalem, and here's how glorious it was in Israel. Israel was worshiping a bunch of idols. They're done. Judah still has an opportunity. But buried within this glory, there is this underlying current of rot, and God's saying, I'm going to judge you for that. So you have the wrath of Yahweh inside this great stuff going on, but inside there's this, if you don't repent, if you don't repent, you're going you're gonna to reap what you sow. It's going to happen. You know, the outbreak of the wrath started with King Ahaz. And it did. He's the third one that Isaiah ministers under. Hezekiah started turning it around with his revival. But then Hezekiah had a son by the name of Manasseh, who was really bad news. So Yahweh, God, is the one who's about to remove, as a result of judgment, something very specific from Jerusalem and Judah. And historically, as we look back, it has happened twice to Jerusalem, okay? And it's going to happen one more time yet in the future. So this is a prophecy that's been fulfilled, it's been fulfilled, and it's going to be fulfilled again, unfortunately. At the time Isaiah's writing this, that first removal is still something they can stop by repenting and, and returning back to the Lord. There were warnings in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, and those warnings given by God are about to become very, very real. So what's being removed? So the translation says supply and support. And I'm going like, okay, what's that? Well, you dig into the Hebrew a little bit, and it's really more thorough than what we read in the English translation. Yeah, he's saying what's being removed, though. In the Hebrew, he's saying it's, what's being removed is support and support. But in, and it's a wordplay. He's using the same noun twice, but in Hebrew, if you use it one time in the masculine and one time in the feminine, it's basically kind of, I'm taking everything away. It's an emphasis point. So verse 1, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support. Then he says what? Well, the whole supply of bread, so anything that you eat, and the whole supply of water, everything that you drink. In fact, anything that you have to have for basic sustenance, he's going to take. So again, looking at the Hebrew grammar, so if you, want, if you really are excited about Hebrew grammar and you want to look at it, this is where it comes from. Genesius says in his grammar, 
what happens when you use a masculine and a feminine. It's just basically, it means that there is a complete and total removal of whatever it is. It's a way in Hebrew to emphasize a point so that it, no one misses the meaning of it. Okay, Because I could say the same wor- the, the word, I'm going to remove all the support, but if I say it in Hebrew with two different inflections like that, now you're going to listen to me because, well, wait a minute, he's talking about removing everything. And, th- and then he adds to it, oh, how complete is this going to be? All the basics of life. Everything you have to have to live. That's what's going to be removed. Now, when somebody hears that, the first response that I think of as a 21st century believer is, repent for crying out loud. God's given you this offer. Might as well repent. What's there to lose? They don't, by the way. Here's what they're looking at. This is Leviticus 26, 25 and 26. This is what's going to happen. I will bring on you an avenging sword, a covenant vengeance. In other words, what God is saying is that if you don't follow what I'm saying and follow the covenant, then I'm going to bring on you a breach of contract action, covenant vengeance. Although you'll gather together in your cities, I will send pestilence among you and give you into enemy hands. So he's saying, I'm going to give you disease. I'm going to take away all your support. When I break off, and here's it, here it is again, when I break off your supply of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, they will ration your bread by weight, you'll eat it and not be satisfied. And did this happen? Yeah, it did. It happened to Israel in the north when they were taken captive by the Assyrians, and it happened to Judah in the south when the Babylonians came. Oh, Jerusalem, it happened twice, under the Babylonians, and it happened under the Romans. And there's one more round yet to come. You can read that one in Zechariah 14. It's coming at the end of the great, at the great Tribulation. But coming very soon is what Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations 2.20, because he's seeing it happen in real time. Lord, O oh Lord, consider whom have you ever afflicted like this? Now remember, these are God's people. They know who he is. They've seen his glory in the temple. They've been given special treatment by the Lord. And they refused to listen to him. So here's what Jeremiah says was going on. Should women eat their offspring and their healthy infants? No, they shouldn't. But that was actually going on in Jerusalem when they were under siege. Should priest and prophet be killed in the Lord's sanctuary? No, they shouldn't. But that was going on because you'd have a priest or a prophet tell the truth and they'd kill him. And of course, Jeremiah wound up getting thrown into a water well that was empty. They didn't like him either. This would be a repeated during the siege of Jerusalem also under Titus Vespasian. Here's what Josephus says about that one. Josephus was an eyewitness. Now, of those perished by famine in the city, the number was prodigious. Estimates are one million. The miseries they underwent were unspeakable, for if so much as the, the shadow of any kind of food anywhere appeared, a war was commenced presently, and the dearest friends fell a fighting with one with another about it, snatching from each other the most miserable supports of life. Nor would men believe that those who were dying had no food, but the robbers would search them when they were expiring, lest any should have concealed food in their bosoms and counterfeited dying. Nay, these robbers gaped for want and ran about stumbling and staggering like mad dogs and reeling against the doors of the house like drunken men. They would also, in great distress, rush into a house to find food two or three times in one day. Their hunger was so intolerable that it obliged them to chew everything when they gathered things like an animal would and they did not abstain from chewing on their girdles and shoes and the very leather that belonged to their shields. And the the very wisps of hay became food to some. This is an eyewitness account of what happened when the Romans put the city of Jerusalem under siege in 70 AD. This happened under the Babylonians as well. You've been listening to a message from Isaiah on the unsafe Bible. Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this major prophet to help us all understand how to apply these messages to our lives today. Well, as we see here in Isaiah, the whole scope and sequence of the life of Jesus from the announcement of his birth to the second coming, the time he'll return for his people, for all those redeemed by his blood. This book is like a person crying out into a busy street, desperately needing to be heard. God is our one true salvation. Isaiah encourages his readers to trust and believe in God because it's God who dispels the darkness that comes from a sin-filled world. If you have questions about today's message or 
You just want to hear more. Don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. Once there, use the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. Just fill out the form and we'll reach out to you. Remember to listen to other teachings from Pastor Ken. Just look under the Media tab at theunsafebible.com. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you can show us your support for the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. No gift is too big or too small and will help us continue to reach the lost with God's Word. We're based out of Jupiter, Florida and want to invite you to join us in person for the next service. All the information you need to come is found at theunsafebible.com. Until then, we want to thank you for joining us right here on The Unsafe Bible.